reading is taken from Judges, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Uh, Judges uh, details the history of the Israelites after they've taken possession of the Promised Land. Uh, It starts with the death of Joshua and then uh, carries on with their disobedience and God's response. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon, from Mount Balhermon as far as Lebuhamah. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served other gods. So before we um, turn to Luke's Gospel... Uh, Let me just encourage all the parents uh, whose children are on the left that Matt is not a prophet. He is not a prophet. He is not a prophecy. Um, So be encouraged. There's great hope for your children even yet. And for our pianist who just ordains at her own self-will when we will and will not sing verses, be encouraged. Um, We're happy just to roll with all those things. So keep that in mind because we're going to be talking about ships and storms and potentially ships that even sink. And so um, we've got to Luke 8. And the reason why we, um, we read from Judges, as you'll notice, is that it's talking about a generation of God's people who had not endured hardship or war. And so they'd come out of these 40 years of wandering and, he, and the scripture says that the Lord had left the nations among them to test them. It was intentional. And we're going to get something similar to that in our text today. We're reading from Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. It's a well-known section, but hopefully we can have some new insights into that. So let's read together God's Word. Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. This is the Word of the Lord. One day, he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out and as they sailed, he fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he woke and he rebuked the wind and the, <clears throat> and the raging waves and they ceased and there was calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and they marveled saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even winds and water and they obey him? Well, let's pray, and then we'll give some thought to God's word. You know this, but you forget it. Having control in any aspect of your life is actually an illusion. It's an illusion that I think the competent and the strong and the successful and the powerful, it's an illusion that that, that they like to project. But, But the Bible would say to us, We're not in control. We were never in control. In fact, the desire for control is actual folly. The only control we have is self-control, and even that is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen, uh, dying to the desire to control is not easy. And nor is it one of those things that is once conquered, always conquered. 
It's more like this daily conviction that I must allow God to be God. Because not only do I know that I am not in control, but I don't possess the divine attributes needed to be in control. I just simply don't possess them. And sort of think of a 14 year old boy, and you say to him, you know, Do you want to ride a motorbike? Well, of course he wants to ride a motorbike. You're inviting him to have fun, excitement, to take control. And the fact that he doesn't have the appropriate attributes to ride a motorbike on the road, like, you know, common sense or fear, let alone actual experience of riding a motorbike, that will not deter a 14-year-old boy. He will say to you, of course I can ride a bike. Of course I can ride a bike. And, and, and like 14-year-old boys, we have this desire for control. And even though we intellectually know, let's even say biblically know, that control is an illusion, somehow we still imagine that, that money will give us control or, or success or power will give us a sense of control. And, and, and all of that is actually corrosive to trusting God. All of that tends to make us less dependent, less prayerful, less thankful and more apathetic in our worship because if you think about it if if you imagine that you have all this control functionally why do you even need god then i mean if you're the captain of your own ship the captain of your own destiny why do you need god you've got success you've got security you've got happiness you've got holidays family friends you've got superannuation and you have it until you don't. You have it till God takes it away. You have it till weariness or, or, or weakness or woe. You'll have it till you get sick or sacked or separated. And it's only when you get these situational storms, you know, some unforeseen drama or tragedy, that your faith will actually have the opportunity to deepen. Because when Jesus wants to deepen your faith, almost always what he will do is disrupt your life. Keep that in mind as we go through this text this morning. Verses 22 to 24. One day, this is Jesus, got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So... They set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke, rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. Now, notice first in the text what, what, what Luke does here. He wants you to know it's Jesus' idea to get in the boat and go to the other side of the lake. And he also wants you to know it is Jesus that thought the transit across was a good time to take a nap. And make no mistake, a little bit later, the disciples know whose idea it was to go across the lake. And they're actually astonished that Jesus would be taking a nap when their lives are being threatened or in danger. And if you ever go four-wheel driving with one of your mates, you're out in the bush somewhere and, and he tells you, oh, you know, there's a great track just over here. Just go down this, this track here. It's, it's excellent. It'll be great fun. And then before you know it, you are chassis deep in mud. And your tyres have no traction. You don't have a winch. Your phone doesn't have reception. It's getting dark. And your mate hasn't even moved from the passenger seat. And you are like staring daggers at him or her. After all, it was their suggestion to go down the track and they haven't done a single thing to help. That's exactly what's going on at text. That's what the disciples are thinking about Jesus. This is his idea to go across the lake. And Luke wants you to know that. It was Jesus' idea. And yes, Jesus thought it was a great time to take a nap. 
Now, remember with the Sea of Galilee, it's, it's pretty small. It's like what, 20 k's by 10 k's. But the thing is with it, it sits in this depression uh, about 200 metres below sea level and it's surrounded particularly on the eastern side with mountains that are like five, 600 metres high. And so what happens is you have these winds that funnel down the mountain and they come careening down onto the lake and you get these, these without literally, without warning, you get these sudden and just violent storms. You know, like just after you said no to a teenager or you say to your wife, calm down, darling. These sudden, violent storms that just rage like a Presbyterian confronted with change or some lefty snowflake triggered by some heteronormative language. And so you end up with, like, you know, Daniel Combridge at a fashion show, panicked. And here are the disciples, they're panicked. And they're not going to wait till Jesus wakes. The boat's getting full of water. It's getting tossed from side to side. And even though they were seasoned fishermen, the text tells us they feared. So they wake him. One imagines that all the water in the boat might have woke him, but it doesn't. And so they wake him. And they say to him, we are perishing. And while they don't say it, the implication is clear. We're in danger and you don't care. We're perishing. You're sleeping. We're crying out and it seems to us that you're not even listening. And Jesus responds and with this mystifying authority, he literally rebukes and he calms the winds and the waves. And the disciples are astonished. It's like when you're in a, a near, near motorbike accident, just months perhaps after you've been released from your last motorbike accident from the hospital. And, and so you find yourself on the wrong side of the road because you swerved, because some numpty pulled out and didn't see you. And so you just managed to miss the front of the car And just as you're starting to relax and then a little chuckle of delight that you've survived, all of a sudden you hear this honking sound and and as you lift your head, you you see this, this truck because you're on the wrong side of the road and this truck is careening towards you as it's locked up in brakes. And you just know to yourself, this is going to hurt real bad at best. And yet somehow, by God's grace, you you manage with one foot on the peg and one hand on the handlebar, you manage to swerve before all of your vital organs end up being collected in somebody's esky. And there's that moment where, where time literally stands still where a calm, if you said, in a sense, befalls you, and you just try to process what happened. What, what happened then? How did I even survive that? That's what the disciples are doing. Everything's just gone calm on the Sea of the Galilee. And this water, this boat, which is half full of water, they're, they're just trying to process what just happened. He spoke, and it all stopped. Because these things force you. They force questions about what I think about God's sovereignty. It forces you to reconsider God's relationship to all the storms of life. And if you were to believe Scripture, if you were to understand that God is both sovereign and powerful and and the world isn't random and it's not out of control, if you had this biblical view of God, then you would understand that God ordains the storms. God is sovereign. And, and he's sovereign not just over the good stuff, which is, it's, you know, I oh, praise God for this. Like, you know, we had a grandson, Noah, like, praise God for that. But he's sovereign even over the bad stuff, the hard things, the horrible things, the unwanted things, the painful things. That's why the prophet Isaiah 45, verse 6 to 7 says, I am the Lord. 
and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being, creating calamity. I'm the Lord who does all these things. And while it is true God is not the author of evil, and while it is true there is deep mystery in all of this, you know, like how is it that God is related from a first cause to a second cause? How is he related to Satan or Judas or Pilate or his own people as they commit sins? That even when evil or hardship or calamity unfolds, like it you know, did in Job's life, that God is sovereign over all these storms. And while Satan and Judas or Pilate's motive may have been evil, that the, the scriptures confirm God's sovereign control and his motives were always to work things for good, even using their evil. That's why how we learn that truth of Hebrews 13, 5, that I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, says the Lord, not even in the trials, not even in the storms. Well, that triumphant confidence of Paul in Romans 8, verse 35, who will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Shall tribulation, a persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or dangers, a sword? And you're all supposed to say, no, none of those things will separate us from the love of God in Christ. Because the purpose of salvation is to make you more like God. To be more like Christ. And so whenever the Lord wants to deepen your faith, he will disrupt your life. And whether that's a relational storm, you know, with a spouse or with parents or grandkids, or maybe it's a financial storm where you get demoted or retrenched, or you get behind on a mortgage or rent, or you see your savings disappear faster than a political promise, or maybe you get caught in some sort of moral storm. And your integrity and your honesty and your purity, it's all put to the test. And, and, and you face a storm of temptation. Could be a car crash, could be cot death, could be cancer, could be a job that you wanted, a man that you loved, or a, or a hope, that, a dream that you'd nurtured. And whenever Jesus wants to deepen you, your faith, he will, he will disrupt your life and he will take you into a storm. And what that does, it destroys the illusion of control. So that you come to understand, brothers and sisters, you are one phone call away, one doctor's visit away, Maybe one car trip away from that illusion of control being shattered once and for all. And in some ways, the life of faith only ever flourishes when that illusion of control finally dies. That the, that the life of faith, it, it can only truly flourish when that illusion of control is finally put to death, when it dies. And more than that, it's not just the illusion of control that needs to die, but it's also you learning to die for your desire for control because you desire to be in control because it's safe. And that's why the Christian life is all about the hearts and motives because you can use money for good or you can use it for control. You can use your job for good or you can use it for control. You can use relationships for good or you can use them for control. And so what God does is he takes you through these storms to teach you how to die to that desire to want to be in, be in control. And deepen your faith so that you're not just functionally or theoretically holding to this idea that let God be God. You're supposed to grow in your faith that, that your God, your Lord, your Savior, that he's bigger than storms, stronger than seas, wiser than winds. This is the same God the scripture tells you, crushed Satan, slayed sin, defeated death. 
It's why the Dutch theologian and one-time Prime Minister Abraham Kuyper wrote, there is not a square inch in which the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine, mine. And you see, when you understand that, that it's not yours, it's his, including your life, that's the beginning of learning how to die to that desire for control. And that's when your faith will start to deepen. You should remember that the next time the Lord disrupts your life. The next time you have a storm, whatever it looks like, you remember this and you actually say, I'm seeing past the storm and I'm seeing that God is wanting to deepen my faith. This is all about how you'll respond. Because in every storm, God asks questions. Look at verse 25. He said to them, where is your faith? They were afraid. And marble saying to one another, who then is this? That he commands even winds and water and they obey him. And if you've got your own Bible before you, feel free to underline this. God is asking questions in every single storm. Where is your faith? What does it look like? In fact, you can go as far as saying that God ordains storms to expose our lack of faith. To expose your lack of faith. Because when life is great and when waters tend to be calm and all your plans are coming to fruition and your family is strong and your work's going good, probably feel like you can navigate quite well, even on your own. And your untested, unstressed faith probably feels quite adequate. But what storms do is they actually reveal our distorted view of life. They unveil all of our disordered loves. They reveal our focus on self. A bit like the disciples in the boat. I'm pretty convinced they're not so much worried about Jesus here that he might die, the Messiah. They say, Master, Master, we are perishing. We are perishing. And I'm not convinced that we included Jesus, at least not as the primary concern. And storms do that. They reveal at a reflex how we actually think life is about us. And it's like we're almost shocked that it would cost us something to follow Jesus. I mean, we've always known it intellectually, perhaps even theologically. But we never actually planned on being in the boat when the storm hits. And not only does it disrupt our lives, it actually disorientates them. We feel sorry for ourselves. If you're younger than most of the older people in this congregation, you probably throw one of those online pity parties you know, with your social media friends. Or you withdraw from God, you withhold in worship, and you wallow in sorrows. Because you're so focused on yourself. And yet in the midst of this storm, Jesus is, is poking through the Holy Spirit, that bony finger into your chest saying, where then is your faith? Where is your faith? And it's not that a shallow faith, it's not a shallow faith that, 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 that the storms reveal. What they actually reveal is a shallow view of Jesus, a shallow view of God, a shallow view of his sovereignty. So much so that the disciples, when they actually saw him jump into action, they're shocked. Who then is this? Because they haven't actually come to grips with his identity. The realisation of his divinity, the bewilderment as his immutability, the incomprehensiveness of his infinity. And if you don't know what any of those words mean, Google them a little bit later. But it is an overwhelming task to digest 
God's sovereignty. They haven't actually contemplated it enough, let alone comprehended it, that God is almighty. And the truth is, everyone who claims to be a Christian trusts God until they don't. They, they trust God until they don't. They trust God until they're in a storm. And the storm is meant to deepen your faith. So you ask the question, who then is this? Do you have an answer to that this morning? Could every single one of you, from the youngest to the elders, could you actually answer that? Who then is this? who brings sickness and cancer and allows his son to go to a cross and allows children to be sick and, 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 and brings dementia into your family and your friends and, and, and puts some to his right and some to his left. Who then is this? Who is this sovereign who rules and, and who, who reigns? And you're supposed to wrestle with that question because the illusion of control is shattered. Surely no one really believes they're in control. You can't even control your own health or your car or your kids. And these storms are meant to deepen and stretch and test your faith. So you ask the question, who then is this? And you're supposed to come up with an answer that looks something like this. It is God. The kind king, the loving Lord, the sovereign saviour, the one who rules and reigns, the one who builds up but tears down, who gives life but then takes it away. It's the one who sees all things, knows all things, ordains all things, reigns over all things. The one who is always good, always just, always right. And the one who rightly disrupts your life to deepen your faith. And while it is true that Jesus often calms the storms, and you'll all have your own story about that, where he tested your faith, and deepened your faith in a storm. I want to also affirm, and, and listen to me when I say this, sometimes Jesus ordains the boat to sink. You understand that, don't you? For his own divine purposes, sometimes he ordains the boat to sink. Not, not because he's impotent and can't save the boat, but because he's omnipotent and he has good and divine purposes in the boat sinking. Stephen understood that when he was stoned to death. John the Baptist, remember him? Imprisoned and then beheaded. And while it's true that both Peter and Paul were arrested, put in prison and then freed, they, like every other bar one of the apostles, end up crucified just like their Lord. Listen, sometimes the boat sinks. But because you know him, and because you have faced many storms in life with him, and because your life has actually already been disrupted and your faith deepened, when the boat sinks, the answer is not panic, not bewilderment, but you go down with the boat singing a doxology. Like John Huss, when he was burned at the stake for his faith. And it's recorded in Fox's Book of Mo uh, Martyrs that he went out singing. Or the English reformers, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer, who were burned at a stake together in the Reformation times. And it's recorded that Latimer famously said to his friend, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England that it will never be put out. And they were burned to death. Or as we sung many times in this congregation, that, that, that much loved and well-known song by Horatio Spafford, It is well with my soul. 
you know, having lost his having lost his fortune and his home in the great Chicago fires, and he, he sends his family to England to, 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 to catch up with family, to, to give them a respite from all their trials. And then the, the, the ship sinks, literally the boat sinks, and his children all perish. And yet he still took a boat, stopped at the place where this, the ship sunk, and he penned those words, it is well with my soul. Or missionaries, Matt and Katie Vinicum, were on holidays with their family and just randomly a kangaroo jumps out in front of their car the day after Christmas. And then Katie's life is changed forever. And when they tell her she's a quadriplegic, her boat sinks. But when you get elected into public office like fellow Presbyterian more redeeming and you're caught up in the political man um, machinations of the day because of your Christian convictions and probably in a couple of days you'll probably get expelled from her political party. Tuesday morning, her boat will sink. Probably. But even still, a deepened faith will go down singing the doxology. Amen.